Okay, let's go ahead and start looking at the practice problems for section 3.2 through 3.4. We can see in this first question, it's giving us different amounts in billions, and we need to come up with a pie chart depicting this data. So if we look, we can see that the first thing we have to do is we have to find the relative frequency of each category first. So we're gonna go ahead and um, compose a frequency distribution. We have our different categories, the amount in billions, and the relative frequency for each. Always make sure that our relative frequency adds to be as close to 100% as possible. Um, if it's way above or way below, we know we've made a mistake. And then we can construct our pie chart from that. So again, remember that the sizes of each wedge represent the relative frequency for that category. We always wanna make sure that we have a title, that each of our wedges has the appropriate category and the appropriate relative frequency. And again, is about the size um, of the circle as it is the relative frequency. So if we're looking at about 33%, we want hunting to take up a wedge that is about the size of a third of that pie chart. We then are asked to go on and construct a Pareto chart. So remember that a Pareto chart is a bar graph or bar chart in decreasing order. So we want to go with the highest amount of spending first to the lowest amount of spending. Again, we wanna make sure we have a title, that we label all of our axes. Put on here, this would actually be um, sport or category. Then we have evenly spaced out bars. Since it's a Pareto chart, it is a bar graph, so the bars do not touch. And then we wanna make sure that we're uniformly distributed over on our billions axis as well. So here I chose to go by half a billion. Um, since we don't have a very wide range here, that's gonna be a good way to do it. Um, if it was a wider range, then we would wanna say, maybe go by billions, but half a billion is just fine. And then we're gonna compare the Pareto chart to the pie chart. And it asks, which is more effective? I'm gonna go ahead and scroll up just so we can see both of them. And what we're looking for is um, effectiveness in showing the amount spend, or spent in the different categories. So if we're just looking right away and we wanted the fastest, easiest way to tell the annual spending, we're gonna get more information clear from this Pareto chart than we did from the pie chart, right? So without looking at, um, this frequency distribution and looking just at the pie chart, we would not have all of the information or even the same information that we're getting from the Pareto chart. So in the Pareto chart, we still have the amount or the billions of each category. We can also answer which one was the highest, which one was the lowest spending. Um, so there isn't as much information given in that pie chart that's given in the Pareto. Um, also, it's um, in general preferred to do a Pareto chart or a bar chart versus a pie chart, um, just kind of in general, general rule. Let's go ahead and move on. Um, these types of questions, I would definitely make sure that we're comfortable with. So I'm looking at number two, and it says for each instance, describe the data as qualitative or quantitative and then state the type of graphic that would be most appropriate for displaying the data and explain why you chose that. So most appropriate here is key. There could be more than one that we could use, but there is always gonna be one that's more appropriate than the others. So I underlined some keywords as we're looking through this. In A, it says the number, which I underlined, the number of, full-time students enrolled in colleges in each year since 1990. So we're looking at the change in a number and we actually have quantitative data here. So we're gonna wanna do a time series graph since it's talking about the change 
in a quantitative variable over time. B says the colors, so we know that we're talking qualitative data, the colors of cars involved in fatal crashes last year. We aren't necessarily looking at any type of a change over time. We're just looking at one period of time and we're looking at the colors of cars that were involved. So just like we saw in that last example, we could use um, a bar graph, a Pareto chart, um, or even a pie chart. Um, but again, pie charts are not going to be the preferred display um, when a bar and a Pareto is an option. C says IQ scores. And again, we're looking at just one period in time. So IQ scores are going to be a quantitative measurement. And since the IQ scores have such a wide range of values that they could be, um, it's gonna be best if we used binned data. We are not gonna want a pie chart that has all of the different IQ scores that could exist. We're gonna to wanna to bin that up and then come up with different ranges that could be um, illustrated. So in that case, we're gonna want a histogram. G is a little tricky at first. So it's the percentage of flights on a single day by each airline. And this is the most important, right? So we're looking at the percentage, which makes us want to think that right away we're looking at something that's quantitative but we're actually not. So the, the variable that we're looking at is airline. So we have, if we were to put this in a frequency distribution, we would have the airline here as our category. And then we have the percentage of flights, which is that relative frequency. So if we're given the relative frequency, but we're looking at the different airlines, we're looking at a qualitative variable, right? Our airline. And then it's going to be the same case as B. So we could do a bar or Pareto chart if we have all of our frequencies. Um, we can also make it with our relative frequencies. And then since we're given the relative frequencies, um, just like in B, we could use the pie chart. Because um, remember that that is constructed from those relative frequencies. Um, but in general, we're going to want to prefer a bar or Pareto instead. Let's move down to three. <clears throat> three has two parts. The first part, we have a stem plot that is given. And it says um, one row of the stem plots given, and we want to identify the values represented by that row. <clears throat> so we know that this is our stem. Our stem is 14. And our different leaves are these values over here to the right. So we should have as many number of data values as we have leaves. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. We should have six data values as well. Notice each one, the first two digits are the digits that comprise the stem. And then each one ends in a different leaf. So if we go down the line, make sure that you <clears throat> represent the different values accurately or label them accurately. And then as always, include a key. So we can pick any value that's in there and say, if for example, if I see a stem of 14 and a leaf of zero, um, this would represent 140 feet. <clears throat> um, B says a dot plot is constructed and a portion of the dot plot is given. So um, it's given here, it is not given in the initial notes. Excuse me, and it says identify the values represented. Um, so remember, a dot plot is just like a bar graph. But the frequencies are represented by dots. So we have two dots under the 132 feet. Um, we have none for 133 or 134. We have three that had a breaking distance of 135 feet. You didn't have to write it the way I wrote it either. You could have listed them out. That would have been just fine. And then we had one that had a breaking distance of 136 feet. Again, make sure that you're labeling all of your variables 
here, um, all the units of measurements. If we're talking feet, we need to make sure to label feet. Also, I made a note in here that if we are constructing a dot plot, it is important, just as it is with any other graphical display of data, to have a title, to make sure our axes are appropriately labeled and distributed. Number four, instead of recreating it, um, I did reference the figure number and the page, so you can reference it in your book, um, but they have a stack plot shown and it says redraw it as a multiple line chart. And then list the advantages and disadvantages of the different representations. So notice, and it's just a rough sketch, I made a note over here, it's not gonna match um, the numbers exactly. But notice that I'm gonna go um, yellow with this one. Um, yeah, that'd be okay. So on the stack plot, what they have is they have all of this filled in, and then they have another um, portion stacked on top of it. But if we want to represent that as just a line, multiple line chart, we're not going to want to fill in those portions at all, because um, that would be considered a stack plot. So we just want to keep it um, just as the lines. Again, labeling the graph itself, each axis, and then making sure um, since we have multiple lines in here and multiple sources of data, we need to make sure to label those appropriately as well. So the difference between a line chart and a stock plot is as we can see, the line chart makes it better to see the individual trends over time. So we can break down the trend of a public enrollment and see it a lot clearer than we can if it's stacked on top of each other. When it's stacked, then we're able to tell the combined enrollment easier and quicker. So um, the multiple line or multiple bar helps the individual and stack helps the combined. Let's move on to the last page here, the last three examples. Number five says weekly instruction time for a school student in the US is 22.2 hours compared to 26.9 hours in China. Is the difference meaningful? And how could a graph be constructed so that the difference is greatly exaggerated? Um, so of course that the um, difference is meaningful, right? Um, it's a different amount of instruction time. But we don't necessarily need our graph to exaggerate that difference. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't happen in media. It definitely does. Um, we've seen bad graphs and bad media and um, skewed data and everything out there. Um, so it is important to make sure to watch for ways that they could exaggerate the difference to make it seem like maybe one country has significantly more instruction time than the other. Um, so notice when we are exaggerating it, we did not start at zero. So we started at 20 and then had our vertical axis go by one. So there really was no um, starting at zero here. So it does make it seem like that difference is quite a bit more. But whenever we start at zero and notice we're still having our axis be uh, evenly distributed. So we're just going by fives instead of ones. But when we do that, we can see that the difference doesn't actually look as exaggerated as it did before. So that's something to look out for whenever we're looking at displays of data. Number six references another graphic in the book. And it talks about the annual high values of the Dow Jones Industrial Average for stocks. So we want to know how it's misleading. And so we can see that it does not start at zero. So we have the same scenario that we just had in number five. It says, how could it be redrawn so that it is not misleading? Um, so the same situation as before, right? If we start at zero um, and possibly expand our vertical axis distribution, um, it's not going to look as misleading. And then 
here, it says, well, okay, let's do that then. Does it change dramatically? And so in this particular one, and you're free to sketch it out, but in this particular example, it's not as dramatic as the difference up here, where we can see it is significantly exaggerated um, when it is drawn misleading. And the last one just asks about pictographs. So why is a pictograph generally a bad idea if we're talking about one-dimensional data? Um, and the reason for that is what we talked about before with scaling and with perceptual distortion. If we are using a picture to represent um, a value or a number or even just a percentage, in general, our mind tends to, to see area as, um, as a bigger increase than it really is. Um, so if we're, for example, having oranges, so I'm gonna sketch this just for fun. Um, of course, I have to use orange, so I will <laughs> draw our axes and talk about um, consumption of oranges. Orange, glad I'm taking your time to do this. Um, and let's say we're talking about um, number of oranges consumed and maybe um, thousands. I will tell you, I love oranges. The clementines are the best. Don't let anyone tell you any differently. Um, I probably eat a thousand in a year. Maybe I'm exaggerating, maybe I'm not, you'll never know. Um, but if we're talking about consumption of oranges, and this is our different year, if I wanted, I'm not gonna really be very, uh, my orange is gonna be a little questionable here. It's gonna look more like a basketball. <laughs> oh, guys, I don't know what that is. Um, is that a rock or a potato? Okay, let me, that's, I, I don't know. I'm gonna, that's not gonna stay there. Okay, let's try that again. Let's just say that I have orange. This is an orange. Um, if I want this part right here, the very top of the orange, to represent where it is on my graph, so maybe this is two, um, and then I want the next one to be three, we can see just by having this pictograph drawn, um, that the area of this circle is a lot larger than the area of this one. Even though it's only going up by one unit, it's going to be um, very exaggerated. And we're gonna look at this at first and think that there's a bigger difference between the two years than there really is. Um, so it's really important to pay attention with pictographs on what are they using to measure it? Um, and if possible, why did they choose a pictograph, right? Like what are they wanting to convince us is happening? So um, hopefully you have learned from this orange graph and are not scarred for life um, and reach out if you have any questions as always.